let's get started. So today we're going to be going over session five and we're going to be going over late game. So that's going to be objective control, bear and take in use, team fighting, shift timings, inner tower and inhibitor takes, enemy jungle control, tracking ally versus enemy tempo and positioning. So that's going to be the focus today. So one of the things that I want to start with first is just in general, the Baron, because it's one of the first things you think about when you think about late game and the most commonly visited topic when it comes to late game. Also like team fighting as well, but team fighting can happen pretty much any time of the game if five people are together. Okay, so one question I want to ask you guys is what should you do after you get Baron? What are the checklists? What do you start thinking about as soon as your team kills the Baron? How many of the enemy teams up? Well, just uh, think about the checklist. Assume that like any scenario can happen. What are the things you want to check? Where it's pushing? Yeah. Like where to push? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That is one thing you can check. Feel free to just uh, chime in and keep keep adding on. Would you check um, your gold for item power spikes? Yeah, that's that's one of the ones to check, but probably less on the priority. All right, so I share my screen with you guys. All right, so whenever you take Baron, the first thing that you want to check after killing the Baron is do we need to base? How soon do we need to base? Most of the time, your first instinct should be base because the faster you base with Baron, the faster you can set up your next play. A lot of people do Baron and they're low HP and they stay on the map which delays the Baron use. It wastes the Baron timer because you want to make the most use of Baron before it expires. So say you finish Baron and you still have um, like full HP, then it's okay to stay on the waves. Or if you still have low amounts of gold and you don't need to base, then you can stay. But if you have a lot of gold or you need to base to heal, then you should base so you can use that Baron buff. This is probably the biggest mistake that I see uh, after a lot of teammates get Baron. They like to stay on the map. And what happens is they just waste the Baron. So they wait like a minute until they base and they just waste the Baron for a whole minute. And then you only have, you know, the rest of the time to spare, which is not too much. Okay, so next thing is the checklist that you want to think about after base. So after you base and you come out of lane, you want to think about, as uh, Professor Boo Boo said, which lane to push for. Generally speaking, you want to get this tower down if it's still up. Then you want to work your way 
into the base. So eventually you want all of these three towers down. Once all of these three towers are down, you work on the inner towers, but you work on either bot or top inner tower. You don't go for the middle one unless you have a really good poke or siege team comp like Ziggs, Zara, etc. Uh, because the mid lane one, you need to have a lot of range. Whereas the side lane ones, you can use the rotation that we focused on in the last lesson to create a numbers advantage to just overtake this easily. Middle of the map is the most defended. So you have to actually have really good siege to actually forcefully take a tower 5v5. Uh, if you have Baron, it makes it a lot easier though. So most of the time you technically can do this with Baron. So that's one thing to think about. And then eventually after you have all these three towers down, then same concept. We want to go for these inhibitor towers. We want to go for the inhibitor towers. Uh, the side one, same concept again, is the easier one to go for. Middle is the most defended, but if you're that strong or if you have good range, then you can go for the middle one. One thing that's also important to know is that the side inhibitors are more impactful in the game because it's much more difficult for enemy teammates to catch the side lane. For example, if you have top inhibitor down and then these minions are flooding into their base, they have to send you know, a member on the top side and then you can stack five people on the bottom side and it creates a 4v5 advantage. So that's one way to use the inhibitors. And then now let's think about after you get Baron or after you get inhibitors, how to prepare uh, for dragons using the inhibitors, using the Baron pressure. So one thing to keep in mind is like, if dragon is coming up, then getting this inhibitor down early is actually really good with a Baron buff because then this will draw a lot of pressure then eventually you can base and take the dragon. However, uh, this is a long con play because as you guys know, like taking the inhibitor, um, it takes a lot of time. So if you want to go for long con play, long term advantage play, then you go for the opposite side pressure. Now, if you want a short term play, say like dragon is spawning in 30 seconds or a minute after you take Baron, then you actually want to play for bot side and bot inhibitor and bot inner tower because right after you take this tower and right after you take the inhibitor dragon will respawn and then you already have this control so you just walk back to dragon and you take the dragon that's the objective control using baron using kind of like distinguishing which side of the map to play to and then next thing that i want to go over is how to do baron so generally speaking the best ward spots for Baron are going to be in the pit and in the bushes, similar to how we mentioned. So usually you want a pink ward in the bush, um, in this bush and in the pit. So generally speaking, you want it in the pit like how I have it here, not over here where I put a yellow ward because you want to be able to detect, detect the wards that the enemy might place over the wall if they're standing over. And that's why it needs to be a little bit in the pit, like this. Same concept applies for Dragon. And then for Baron buff, you want another pink ward in this bush as well. And then, depending on which side you are, if you're blue buff side or blue side, then you're going to ward the entrances. You're going to take these uh, plants so they have no way to get in. So they can't steal the Baron by doing like this and you can also ward the top entrance too so this is how you want to set up for team baron plays and one thing that's really important for baron is that you have to know that you have enough damage you have to have enough dps and you also have to have a tank so here's the formula for baron so one person tanks it one dps is and then usually more can stay on the baron if the Baron is free, but if the enemy is going to contest, then literally everybody else, the three others, are looking to turn. So they can turn 
which is another phrase of you know just getting a pick uh, using fog of war because I'm sure you guys understand the concept of like the enemy having to check each bush and then if someone is standing in a bush and the enemy is coming close then you have the moment of surprise or you can use the walls to turn so everybody else has to look for engage angles so this is one engage angle to that enemy here this is another engage angle and then this is another engage angle so you'd usually have a word here and then if you're like alstar or nautilus you would engage on this guy right here as they're trying to check for baron because you have to get this close to even ward this area and then also, if you are a really strong champion that can be pretty independent, you can also come from up here. So you would have this bush warded, and then if you see like a jungler coming this way, you can fight them if you're an independent like solo laner. Or if they come into here, like everyone stacks here, now you have to flank. Imagine if I'm like Vladimir. You just have a really good flank on their AD carry. Because everyone's going to be up front here. You also go on their AD carry. So that's Baron Control 101. And then this also goes into team fighting. So this is pretty important when it comes to the late game and applying it into the mid game. And then the next thing that we're going to start talking about is shift timings. So shift timings is mainly based off of understanding how solo laners move across the map. So we'll show you more examples because this is pretty complicated stuff, the shift timer stuff. So I'll show you more examples in real game, but for now I'll show you uh, the concept behind it. So what is what are one of the advantages that a top laner or a mid laner gets from pushing side lane? So I, I wanna hear some answers. What are a few advantages that a solo laner gets from pushing a side lane? really deep it drags people away from objectives yep that's a good one anything else if you push it to the tower is it that minion that you lose as well yeah yeah the enemy team will lose those minions and you gain minions from going into the silent and you gain slow exp too so as a sign laner like a top or mid laner uh, that's what going to the side lane is good for. The main thing that we're going to talk about is that what Matt said, which is when you push a mid lane or you push a side lane to the enemy tower, then it drags the enemy players away from a certain objective. So say you want to make a play onto Herald or Baron, then you push a side lane to drag enemies away from the Baron, then you move to the baron and then you can start the baron while this guy is catching the wave and or you can use the same concept of okay this guy is catching the wave now i'm gonna shift pretend i'm the target dummy that started walking to mid lane and then you can force the fight mid so this is called shift timers so we need to watch the map very carefully even if you're an AD carry, jungler, support, top lane and mid lane, etc. Uh, we need to see when the enemy has shift timers and when we have shift timers. When we have shift timers, we want to look for fights. When the enemy has shift timers, we want to play safe. So think about that. And then the next thing that we're going to talk about is enemy jungle control and so let's talk about where to ward whenever you're taking a certain tower so if you're trying to take mid tower and you're trying to take you know any inner tower you don't want two deep wards because if you have a ward here and you're trying to take this tower it can be pretty useless it's still useful because any ward is good but it's pretty useless because it does not necessarily tell you too much unless the enemy has like an insane engage range of here to here so a better ward is going to be in the cat area one term that we learned before because you'll actually see this is a more common spot for like supports or junglers to walk to try and engage to get a flank 
walking through this corridor. This is somewhere you, where you can actually hit and turn onto without getting shot by the tower. Another good warding spot is over the ramp here or the rafters when taking the tower. And then of course, like uh, if you have side laners that are coming in to flank through river, then you can ward these bushes to cover your flanks. Especially if you're an 80 carry, warding the flanks is really good. Okay, and then when you're taking mid tier two tower, the really good spots to ward are actually right here because you can see the rotation from bot gate and bot lane to mid. So you can see when like this guy is trying to take over this uh, tower and sending more people to help. And this is also a really good pink ward in this spot right here or sweeping because a lot of people, if you're the red team and you're going between towers, you want to see uh, who's over this wall here. Because imagine if I'm like a Zed, Zareth, Zoe, etc. champion, and I see the enemy here, I can actually engage in on them and probably one shot like squishy supports. So good pink ward to have here on the rotation. And then another good warding spot to have is right here when you're taking tier two tower. Covers this area, possibly covers a flank angle. And then when you're taking inhibitor towers, uh, the mid one is the riskiest because you have so many flank angles that you can come through here. Behind you, they can come through here. So it's good to ward the flank angles here and also here whenever you're going for inhibitor towers too. Uh, this ward is kind of ambitious because most of the time they just sweep it or kill it. But if you can get these type of wards, that's also good too. And then same thing with this ward as well. When you're taking bot towers, it's going to be, I'm only going to do one side and then you want to apply that kind of to um, the other sides as well. I'm going to do one side of the map. So, so generally speaking, as if we were blue team. So if you're taking this tower here, a good warding spot would be right here. You can also go deeper as well. You have to be careful of the flank if an enemy jungler ganks you this way, right? Like if the enemy red team jungler is going this way. That's why, as we mentioned before, having a pink ward in this bush is OP because it also covers the flank, right? So your support can just ward that. And then this is also a really good ward is the tri bush ward uh, because a lot of junglers try and go for this blast plant into ganking bottom when you're hitting the tower. So if you're a support, or if you are a jungler and trying to support a dive, you can go here, take the blast plant, ward this, or ward this, take the scryers, and then this sets up for this tower. Going for tier two tower though, what's important is making sure to cover the flanks and we kind of want to apply the same concept here to cover the left flank. And it's much easier as you can as you notice, going for side towers, right? Because they can't really flank that easily. You can ward here, and most, most people don't really flank through tri bush, so I'm gonna ignore that bush for now. And then if you're going for this tower here, you just have to cover this, or over here. So going side lane is very easy. And then let's say we're on top side, and we have to deal with the tri bush. If you're going for this tower here, you can ward here, or here to cover the potential rotations. If you're going for this tower, it's very simple. You ward here and then possibly the flank right here. And you're good. You can go for this tower very easily. If you're going for this tower here, I would recommend warding right here. And after that, you're pretty much good too. So going for side towers, as you notice now, very common thing. You don't have to worry about as many flanks. That's why a lot of lower elo players kind of like die, even though they get barren and they push mid and then they kind of get flanked and then die. Or it's just numbers disadvantage. I noticed that a lot too, where they push without their entire team.
All right. Any questions about that, guys? All right, looks like we're good. And then the next thing that we're going to go over is tracking ally versus enemy tempo and positioning. So that's going to be something we're going to go over in the VOD reviews, and that's going to be more important. Also, for next week's lessons, we're going to do mechanic checks and uh, mechanic drills. So be excited for that one because uh, I really like doing like mechanic lessons too. So let's go ahead and have you guys uh, give me your best VODs that I can download to rank games um, or VOD links that you might have. So the topics for today that uh, you are going to be looking for are kind of like late game type of games where you might have had Baron takes and uses the team fighting, sh pretty much like the late game stage, like going for towers, etc. So uh, go ahead and type your in-game name for me to search up in general chat. And then also give me a recommendation of a game that you want me to uh, look into. And if you don't have a recommendation, then just say, no recommendation. No way uh, up for you guys. Here. Dude. I... Like, I don't know if this will work, but I just sent you out the one of the replays if that's easier for you to open since I'm on EU. Oh yeah, that should work. All right, let's go into Professor Toto's. Okay, uh, Professor, uh, so this game, you're going to have to download the, uh, because it's not a ranked game, I cannot actually have that download button. So you have to download it and then you have to go into your League of Legends folder, replay folder, and then upload that replay uh, file. You mean, you know, on Discord, you mean? Yeah, you can send it privately or in general. 
Okay. But that looks like a good game to go over. And then I'm going to do some magic here so that I can open this EU replay on my NA client. Alright, I think that should work. Is this the right one? It is. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Alright, so what are you thinking, Calvar, when you see this loading screen? Uh, well, first thing I'll look at is my lane. There's, it's a bit tricky. Just because of the damage between Zyra and the combination of root, the roots and stun locks from yep. them. Yep. Um, I also need to be wary of the fact that the later this game goes, Kale's going to become an absolute powerhouse. Yeah. Um, so she will scale harder than what Quinn does. Um, personally, I don't like Azir, so I don't think it's that use that's a as useful pick later game. So I always felt like that was a bit of a problem. Yep. Especially into Ori or and Oriana and Viego, so that's a strong engage Viego all into an Oriol combo so I had to be got to be quite careful of that especially as that goes on yep mm -hmm. so yeah this is perfect this way of thinking that you're going through right now this is what you should always do whenever you're playing uh ada carry is start thinking about the team fights how to play mechanically the laning phase and then the next thing you want to think about is the jungle tracking uh, you want to think about the mid tracking as well because middle laners can also roam bottom. And then also, one thing I noticed is Bane is a really bad pick here. Uh, what is your current champion pull of AD carries? Um, normally it's Cogma uh, Twitch and Ezreal, mm -hmm. but. Um... I've heard that Vayne is just a slightly better version of Kog'Maw for early early game. So that's why I was like, I'll try it out and just practice on it a bit. That might actually be a that might actually be a misconception because Kog'Maw uh, can be stronger in early game. Like in this lane for sure, Kog'Maw is definitely stronger because you need the extra range to deal with the Zyra and Jin. Uh, whereas low range versus like super high range supports. Um, or like really strong supports is a bad combo. So here actually Kong'Maw is better because you'll have the extra range uh, with your W to actually deal with like Zyre just walking up on you. But generally speaking, uh, Vayne is generally 
better than Kagma. I do think that is true because you can be more self-sufficient. Uh, Kagma is very strong, better than Vayne if you have resources like Lulu, if you have resources like people engaging for you. And then one thing for sure is you want to uh, pick champions that require less resources when your team is not willing to offer those resources. So champions on your team that have CC or champions on your team that kind of like help you deal more damage are champions that you want to be picking Bane, Twitch, and Kogma in. And if you have like really greedy champions, like in this game, you have a really greedy jungler. He picked like a jungler that doesn't really uh, offer much CC in much early game. And then you have a really greedy mid laner too, uh, because Azir kind of wants to be his own hyper carry too. And then you already have technically another AD carry top. Uh, so you don't have like an engage, you don't have any CC engage anywhere on your team that's reliable. So in this type of game, uh, champions like Ezreal would be great, Zaya would be great, uh, champions like Lucian would be great, because they're more self-sufficient, they don't need your team to kind of like do a lot for you. So that is my two cents on the um, pre-game win condition. Of course this game you still can pop off with Vayne, it's just that one thing I noticed is Vayne's, one of Vayne's biggest weaknesses is uh, if the enemy has a lot of damage, and the enemy does have a lot of damage. So, I usually don't like uh, playing squishy AD carries or low range AD carries against high DPS team comps. That's why Vayne is really good against tanks. Not just because she's a tank shredder, but because tanks can't one shot you like a Kale can late game. Also, Viego is like kind of a champion that has one shot potential too. Okay, so let's let's go into late game, and we're gonna focus on the late game here. So right here we see the enemy starting this Baron, but notice how the enemy in this game here does not have good setup. Oriana is bottom, Kale is not even here. They didn't bring anybody to this side first before starting the Baron. So now that you know like these concepts, you can understand why going through the checklist, going through the plan significantly increases your Baron success rate. Yeah, this is a very low Baron success rate from blue team, as we notice here. But take a look at this. See how Oriana is pushing bottom here? Now red team yep. has to catch. Now, if blue team in this situation were to start Baron, they would get it. Because look, Kane's bottom. They have to catch. They have to catch. So this guy doesn't have to catch because they don't have the midway vein. But the fact that these two lanes have to catch means that this is a good Baron success rate. The only issue is where's our pink ward in the pit? And where's our pink ward in the dot brush right here? And then this Viego doesn't have sweeper. And you see that these guys are not going through the proper steps and they're not using the knowledge that we talked about today when it comes to the shift timers and pushing the side lanes. So they should have definitely got Baron here. It's good that they still do it. Um, go for it, it's just a little bit late. And then here, uh, let's take a look at this. Really good 1v1 because you saw they were on Baron, you just chased the Orianna that had no flash. Vayne can do that. And you're actually doing very well uh, this game. So 5, 1, and 2, even though you had a really hard lane. And then here, what should we do from this position? What do you think? Well, initially, I kind of wanted to push the midwave back out to get midwave control. But um, with how the rest, the rest of them have been going and chasing it, I want... I ended up just going to back them up since I ended up being having the highest damage. Yeah. For all of us. Um, so this, I'm gonna pause the game right here, and this is kind of like the main thing I want to focus on. Um, so right here, we're focusing a lot on Baron today. Uh, we just killed Oriana. The clear answer is to start the Baron, 
you have one tank on it, Kane. You have one DPSer on it, Vayne. Everybody else looks for good turns. Everybody else looks for good fights. And then after someone starts a fight, you instantly pull off. Kane instantly pulls off. And then you go for the team fight. That's a 4v5. You kill more people, repeat until you can just take the Baron and they're too scared to come closer. So that's going to be how you go for the Baron take here. So I'm going to speed forward. We didn't get much done here. And then here, your Azir's catching. See how Azir's catching here, right? Mm -hmm. So technically, uh, these guys have advantage on this top side. So it's not our shift timer here, it's their shift timer. So Soraka shouldn't be pushed up here. So I hope you guys can see uh, exactly how like those shift timers kind of like indicate when the enemy plays aggressive and when they're playing for the Baron. Here we're a little bit far from Baron. Nice, Kale got it. Or Kane got it. Alright, I'm gonna pause here since we kind of like went over uh, what we got from that, which is the Baron takes and kind of like the early game laning champion select as well. So most important thing to think about is shift timers, Baron control, uh, using the Baron turn because we had a 45 situation. We didn't use it. If we got Baron, that would have turned our game completely around and we would ace them pretty much because they would kept coming in like without a uh, numbers advantage. So it just takes one person to ping the Baron in those situations. Actually, I'll go over the Mordekaiser game, because you've been popping off with Mordekaiser. And I do like to see the Mordekaiser go Yo, actually this was a really good setup at the start. Because... I've been... Honestly... I don't know why, but I've been liking starting chickens. Starting it's chickens? Like my new thing. Yeah, kind of feels nice starting chickens. Like, I don't have to worry about a leash, I can kind of just... I don't want to take time from, like, bot leaners, because... Real one thing I noticed from bot leaners is sometimes they overstay when you're leashing. It's like I kind of just want to do my own thing. The only issue is if you start chickens, you always have yeah. to um, start chickens, or not. When you start chickens, you're starting top side. If you only start chickens, then you're never. Yeah, I, I want to. Top. I want to start top because of the Zyra root bot. Just since mm -hmm. their their bot lane is doesn't have that much as outs once you're on them. Yeah, so, so this, that's is why a, this is a specific thing for Jace and for like a lot of ranged top laners is usually those type of lanes you want to path to them because you want to make sure they have a good early game because they're snowball champions. So that's important to think about. Yeah. So here I would actually start bottom. Okay. Okay, let's take a look here. So these guys overstayed. Are you fast forward a lot? Yep. Uh, we're mainly focusing on late game today. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yep. I forgot. So in this situation, we have a few options. We don't have numbers advantage. Uh, we're actually very strong in team fight because we have a lot of team fight champions like AOE, Twitch, Zyra, uh, even Mordekaiser has some decent AOE. Nas is good late game scaling. So at this stage of the game, um, if you know you have the better team fight because you have better AOE, you have better scaling champions, you have more items. Like if you just add up the item spikes, even though technically we're down gold, if we add up the item spikes, we have more total items on more important carries. So right here, if we just wait until the J spawns, we literally group up and we go for mid push into any team fight. We engage on anybody we see. If we don't see anyone, we can go for Baron and then do the turn strategy like we said, 
or we push mid and then we rotate to the top strategy like we went over in previous game, we would be able to get a huge advantage. So let's see if that happens. But yeah, this is decent. This is decent. We're grouping up. Only issue is we didn't push mid wave before we did this. So see how like mid wave is coming here. So we have to track that and we have to ping our teammates to go for this. And usually it can't just be one teammate because then the Twitch will just die. So we have to also like be assisting them pushing this wave in and then head to the Baron because what if like they just go mid here, take this free tower. And then meanwhile, these people like hold you off on Baron. You would just lose a lot of EXP, you would lose towers. So it's important to track the mid wave. So here, uh, this is a decent plan. I, I kind of like this. We're kind of hiding. They don't know where we are, but we see them. Well, we just in this game, to... this Jace did not like to group up for some reason. Yeah, I think it's fine as long as he doesn't die. He's trying to poke. Yeah. And then here we're coming at a surprise to them, which is really good. We caught them split up. We're four together and we got the surprise play. Yeah, really good. So pretty good beat vision setup. Not very many pinks, but the concept is good. If you are stronger, you do want to be the one to ping your teammates to go to Baron. So we added up the items here. And then here, let's go over the concept of how we use Baron. One thing I really liked here is that these guys based, right? These three people based. One thing I don't like is that Jace base didn't base and he has a lot of gold. So notice how this Jace is now gonna be in a dilemma. I have to base and get my items or I push and what happens is now I'm not as strong on the push. So you'll see what I mean here. So first of all, uh, in this situation, uh, we kind of go for the dragon in this situation when you honestly, at this point of the game, when it's like two, two dragons and in this situation, uh, you have a pretty good opportunity to be like, Hey, like you can take dragon and that'll be your third dragon. It's going to be, you know, you're playing for cloud soul. It doesn't really affect us too much. And let's just take your free towers and then zone you off from your base. That is an option that you have here. This option is a little bit risky if our Jace isn't coming. Because uh, then the Lux would be there and then that would be a 4v5. So a little bit risky, but it works out. Uh, Lux kind of disconnected, I guess. So here we have Baron use and we play a pretty decent Baron because Jace gets like a two towers here, you guys get Dragon. But notice how in this situation, we didn't really use Baron like as perfectly as we would have liked, which is like the best case scenario when you get Baron is you eventually translate that into inhibitor. And the reason is because we contest Dragon. So after you get Baron, you want to go through the checklist, base, go back to lane, think about what to play for next, play as a group so you don't get caught out. But you also want to think about like, is it worth like delaying our tower taking for neutral objectives? Sometimes it is worth, sometimes it isn't. In this case, I'd say it isn't because cloud drag plus it's not cloud soul plus uh, they're in a situation where they're literally leaving their base open if we just run past them and take their base. That makes sense. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll be honest, late game is kind of like my worst where it's like, I'm good at like setting up early, but it's like, if, if I, if the things don't go aligned together perfectly, I just fall apart. Yeah. I mean, like I'm a very that's like right. snowball -y player, if that makes sense. That's all right. Because you're, um, most people are like that, which is completely fine. Yeah. Uh, but the goal of today's bootcamp, today's session, bootcamp session is so you can explore some of these strategies as you play. Yeah.
Yeah. The Vio the Viego game was dumb because it was like I've been playing a lot of Mord and like tanks, and it's like I want to try something different. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do not remember how. To, I forget they change the Viego every patch, so it's like my brain does not work as mm -hmm. like it can't like know like the regular numbers, and it's like oh crap. I think I'm gonna die. All right, I'm gonna mute. Yep, no worries. All right, so this is Professor Boo Boo's game, and right here, let's see how the game is. Oh, you're doing really well. Well, this is a pretty solid early game, seven, two, and zero, but our carries are a little bit underfed. So let's take a look at early game. I can already guess that you probably focus on top lane a little bit too much, and here. <laughs> Top lane was doing very fine by itself. Yeah, so here I can tell uh, kind of the result. Uh, I can tell that you started bottom this game just off of the late game result. And notice in this game, uh, we don't want to path top lane. We want to start top. We want to start top and path bottom because Tom Kench is a tank. Singe is kind of a tank too. And Singe is also very annoying to gank. These are not the lanes that will help you carry in the team fights, right? Ezreal, hyper carry. Jin, AD carry. Swain and Vlad, hyper carries. And then Enchanters are team fight carries in itself. So we want to path top to bottom in this case. And this is important. Uh, I think people might get confused in this situation because they might be like, oh, I don't want to gank bottom because we don't have like really good CC. But in a situation where you have like tank tops, even if you have CC top lane, but double tank or even one tank and he can't really carry, then you don't really want to put too much resource into him. And you don't want to path to him and give him your first gank and your second gank. So that's how I can tell that in this game, we can see the issue is uh, our gold is on our, our gold share is on our Tom Kench, as we can see here, 8,000 to 4,600, right? But the issue is their gold share on the 80 carry is 9,000 to 5,400. So here we're at a big disadvantage and then support as well. So just looking at the game right now, you probably have like a 10%, 20% chance of winning just based off of that, based off of uh, draft and based off the early game deciding to path top. You can tell, you can tell from this? Yep, just from this. Yeah. So that. that's important uh, when thinking about uh, before a game starts, have a solid loading screen plan. Think about think about the team fights. Think about early lane. Think about early ganks. Think about uh, where you can get good ganks off. Who is worth ganking for? This sets up for the late game, just like this. Yeah, the uh, it doesn't mean you automatically lose. You just say that your win chance like went from like um, maybe like fifty percent or higher to like 10 to 20 percent based off of that because items will carry a lot in late game items definitely do a lot of work so the main issue with that engage in that situation there is we don't have enough damage so that, that, that's based off of the early game items, right? We don't have enough damage. So um, in those situations, we have to like uh, get them a little bit lower with our, our poke first before we engage, or we have to have numbers advantage. When you're weak on items, the only comeback mechanic is number advantage, getting picks. Like for example here, what's one thing that we see in the map 
That's a good indicator for this fight. Didn't you stop? Yep. So here, we want to engage. We want to be very aggressive in this play here. We have Singe's top. Any fight here, we should win. Because they don't have Singe here. And we have numbers advantage, so they have to run away. Yeah, so we do win the fight, it's just that they get away. So that's just an issue of like a uh, kind of like team fighting. So here, like the Vlad ignoring the Jin here is a little bit unfortunate. Then here we don't have to zone yet because we're full HP, and they're the ones running away. So we have the numbers advantage. And then here, you can. I because I use a zonia here because I'm so tired to go in, do my ult, and then die. So maybe I just did it too early because yeah. in this case you really didn't need, it, need to use it. Yep. In that case, you didn't need to use it. Uh, there's very different uh, circumstance. So this is a really good engage because think about this: they're sandwiched. Vlad is on left. Ezreal, Tom Kench on right, and. They have uh, only, they have like three people here, right? They only have three people here and they have no like turret safety, right? And Nidalee cannot participate here. It's too far away. If we understand a little bit about like Nidalee's kit, a little bit too far away to hit you. Uh, she can't turn into a cougar and jump on you instantly. So you have time to react if you get low. And you want them to stay in the fight. You kind of want them to hit you, because if they hit you, that means they can't run away. And Singe is top. It's a very different circumstance from this team fight here. Because in this circumstance, uh, they don't, they're not scared. They don't have to run away here. Reason being is because we don't have a numbers advantage in this fight here. It's three here versus three here. It's even. Yeah. So we don't have numbers advantage here, and uh, also uh, when you're team fighting, you want to think about the follow follow up. In that situation, Vlad is good follow up because Vlad is a frontliner. Tom Kench is also a frontliner in this game. Uh, so Tom Kench was on the bomb side. Vlad is also on the top side. So they are like frontliners. They like to get in the middle of the fights fast. Uh, but this time here. Uh, Ezreal and um, Seraphine, they can help you, but they cannot tank damage with you too. So they can't help you kind of stay alive. Uh, they're also really weak. If they're stronger, then this is really good too. But your 3-3 is not stronger because items. If we just add up the items, they're stronger. And we don't have a... We don't have a advantage in positioning here because it's even numbers. So it's very different uh, circumstance for that fight. And then let's take a look at this engage here too. So same thing in this situation. Uh, when we're not ahead in terms of like a team fighting they're ahead in this situation if we compare items because they're at 80 carry and their carries have more gold our tank has more gold so if we want to be strong in these fights then we have to let the tanky guy go first to utilize his extra gold so tom can has to engage first if we want uh, to use that extra advantage so here uh this wasn't a good engage just because in this situation, we, there is no advantage. We don't see indicators like Singe going bot, top. It's just even number fight. We kind of get uh, in a situation where we think that we have numbers advantage, but we should always assume that uh, if late game comes by and Singe is not on side lane and Swain is not on side lane or any solo laner is not on side lane, then they're probably around the majority. So here, let's take a look at the shift timer concept. 
Ezreal's bottom, so we want to play defensive mid. He's getting free bot tower. And then eventually they're going to come bottom, so this guy has to leave. Or if they don't go bottom, then uh, they're, then this Ezreal can just keep pushing. But in this situation, I think it's better to rotate mid. I think Ezreal's doing the right play here. We just have to be patient enough to wait for the Ezreal before going in here. Ooh, that was a really good combo though. So I actually really like that combo. The, we had a really good angle because Ezreal ulti hits. So he he participated from over here. That's really good. And then you ultied and then you double dash. So really good Diana mechanic here. I really want to see what we do after this. Because this is the one um, next play that can kind of like swing the game into our favor. So what do you think is the easy answer here? What to do next? Yep. The Baron. Good pings on the Baron. I'm going, I'm going, they don't want it. So here, one thing, this is when you should be pinging. After this guy and after this guy. We shouldn't use our flash for the Singe tier because uh, we don't have any spells. And even if we can kill the Singe, I wouldn't even use flash for that. Because Dyna flash is worth more than one kill at this stage. Because it doesn't change anything if the Singe is alive or not. The Baron is already free. Now I would start pinging Baron. Because uh, I noticed this is a low elo thing. The low elo players take like uh, extra like five seconds to react to pings. So it's like uh, we ping here, right? At 11, uh, they react at like 16, 17. They have to ping a little bit ahead of time. So like around here, and then they would instantly go. So yeah, this is definitely a Baron angle if we go instantly, but now it's not so much. Um, it can still be good, but maybe the enemy team just has no vision here. Yeah, so they don't have any vision here, so we kind of um, got a pretty good Baron. And then now we're going to go over how we utilize this Baron here. So really good, everybody base. Everyone instantly spends their gold. Now here's the issue that this is the trap play. We shouldn't go for the dragon here. We should push first, use our Baron buff, bot, mid, take these towers, take as many towers as we can, use up our Baron, use our, our entire Baron buff, and then do dragon after. See how that makes way more sense? Because why would we use our precious Baron buff for a dragon if we can just get the dragon after our Baron expires? It just gives you an extra minute of Baron buff to take an extra tower. So here we kind of like uh, use that extra like minute to deal with like the dragon and it slows down our, our tower take. Like everyone's splitting up again, no one's getting any towers except the uh, uh, professor here. So yeah, hopefully this showcases how uh, when you do Baron, you want to stay together. You want to think about, okay, which towers to go for. Be decisive with that. Uh, the worst thing that possibly could happen is splitting up, uh, focusing on neutrals when they're not super important. And that leads on to a wasted Baron. So th in this situation, I think we were actually in a strong winning position uh, from this point on. And if we continue to push down our Baron lead, I say our win chance was like um, solidly like a 50 to 60%. It's only, it would be higher, but their team comp is uh, really strong.
All right, so I only have time to do uh, one more VOD review. And then we'll continue on with other lessons next week. Alright, so in this situation, we just got a kill on Quinn. We just pushed down mid tower. So right from here, what do you think is a good option for us? Feel free for anybody to chip in. Doesn't have to be just the uh, bestest bro. So what I are feel like you? Would, I feel like one of the better options is he could go up for Baron. Yep, exactly. So right here. They are push. They're stuck in this little 20% uh, of the map, maybe a little bit less. And you can get control of Baron, and you can even start the Baron because you have uh, enough damage at this point in the game. Even though it's 20 minutes, it's because we have a lot of gold. So we the items make up for the time, and then you can go for the Baron right now. You have the numbers advantage, you have the positional advantage, and you have the gold. So right here, we can head to Baron, and by now, the Baron would have been ours. So notice how these little interactions, these little one-man advantages or positioning advantages can lead into a huge snowball. So I don't like this Baron call because Victor died, Nar died, and in this situation, like they're close enough to react. So if they know that you're going for Baron, they can easily stop this. So we definitely had better options than this. Uh, we definitely had better opportunities than this. It is a little bit risky. Uh, works out for us really well, I think. Or it's actually not like super well, but uh, it's not the worst case result. And the main reason because of that is because we're in the lead. But when you're this far in the lead, like this type of game, we should have had a much better opportunity, which was that 20 minute Baron. And then here, we're kind of like desynced. This is a chaotic game now because of time, kind of like that misplay. But even in the situation, we just need one Calm Mind to head over and get the Dragon Soul. So this is a late game scenario that uh, is pretty good to cover as well, which is what's more worth, Baron or Dragon Soul? Uh, Dragon Soul is usually more worth it, but one thing to keep in mind is that if you're this far ahead, you shouldn't even be able to have to make this decision. You just get both. So uh, in this situation, like you could technically just go over and fight these guys first, win the fight, and then go for Dragon, then take the Baron. But um, if you trust your team that, okay, yeah, they're fine over here. It looks like they are fine. Then, yep, you can definitely do the Dragon here, run over, start the Baron after winning the fight. So I think this game seems pretty easy uh, after this point, just because we have Baron, we have Dragsoul, we have uh, 6k gold lead, we have tower lead. So at this point, all you have to do is send four people bottom, take this tier two tower, take the inhibitor tower, Nar can stay top to draw pressure, can TP to join as well. 
and that should end out the game. So let's see exactly kind of like what happens. So the guys, the guys decide to go for top instead. It works out, but it's not the most ideal play. And I hope you guys can see why it's not the most ideal play. Is because we're in a situation where we're making Victor be the one in the side lane, but he doesn't have TP. So that's why the NAR should have been left alone here, and then everyone else on the opposite side. Alright guys, and then the last thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is uh, trying to make a good climb for kind of like the rest of this month. Uh, so it's been around like, uh, uh, it's been 10 days pretty much since, uh, you know, the 1st of July. And I really want to see you guys um, kind of apply a lot of these sessions now that you have a lot of the fundamental knowledge and you can review in the VODs. This is the perfect time to play more. This is the perfect time to play maybe 1.5 times more games, two more games a day, and kind of go for those like rank goals of yours. And then our next like five sessions are going to be like fine tuning, going over more material. We're going to do more bots. We're going to do mechanic checks and it's going to be more on kind of like covering, filling in the holes of everything that you already learned and some new stuff, but not a whole lot of new stuff. The mechanics lesson that I'm going to plan for you guys is going to be new stuff, but the other stuff is going to be going over kind of like these previous sessions in either finer detail or repeating and reinforcing what we already learned. So this is a good time to kind of like grind a little bit more and kind of like make it a goal for yourself. So grind, watch replays, watch the VODs, had add notes and kind of like go over specifically uh, what you need to improve on and start a little bit at a time. All right, and that is the end of today's lesson. And I'll stick around for a few minutes to answer any questions. Otherwise, uh, you guys can go. Have a great one, guys. All right. You need some... I guess I have one question today. Yep, go ahead. Do you have any recommendations on, like, when you fall behind? Like, there's not really a, a catch-up mechanic in the game, so it's, like... So... Do you have any, like, ideas for, like, if you're, like, really behind and you need to, like, get back yep. up? Or, like, you're a scaling champion, but you're bullied heavily early, so you're you're not in the right position. Yep, so best mechanic or macro to play from behind is numbers advantage. Singe shows top, we engage. We win the fight even if they're stronger because we have numbers advantage. The other thing to do is uh, accept that like the game might not be winnable, say if you're mental, go into the review, focus on why you got behind in the first place, fix that mistake for the next game. You know what? That sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. I just had one question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what time does early game uh, stop and mid game start, and then late game? The same thing with mid game and late game. So late game is Baron. When Baron kind of like comes on to the table, uh, so early game. Hours? Yep. Or... Yep. So there's no like rule about it, but um. You basically spread it out based off of the topics that we kind of like listed in the schedule, like when uh -huh. each kind of applies. So early game is definitely during like laning phase when people are more likely to stay in their own lane. Mid game is more when like first tower goes down and like, you know, all of a sudden like random people pop in your lane and stuff. Late game is yeah. definitely when more people just like stay as four or five. Okay.
All right. Have a good day, guys. Thank you. You too.